planet's diverse, thriving ecosystems may seem like permanent fixtures, but they're actually vulnerable to collapse. Jungles can become deserts, and reefs can become lifeless rocks, even without cataclysmic events like volcanoes and asteroids. What makes one ecosystem strong and another weak in the face of change? The answer, to a large extent, is biodiversity. Biodiversity is built out of three intertwined features, ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity. The more intertwining there is between these features, the denser and more resilient the weave becomes. Take the Amazon rainforest, one of the most biodiverse regions on Earth due to its complex ecosystems, huge mix of species, and the genetic variety within those species. Here are tangled liana vines, which crawl up from the forest floor to the canopy, intertwining with treetops and growing thick wooded stems that support these towering trees. Helped along by the vines, trees provide the seeds, fruits, and leaves to herbivores such as the tapir and the agouti, which disperse their seeds throughout the forest so they can grow. Leftovers are consumed by the millions of insects that decompose and recycle nutrients to create rich soil. The rainforest is a huge system filled with many smaller systems like this, each packed with interconnected species. Every link provides stability to the next, strengthening biodiversity's weave. That weave is further reinforced by the genetic diversity within individual species, which allows them to cope with changes. Species that lack genetic diversity due to isolation or low population numbers are much more vulnerable to fluctuations caused by climate change, disease, or habitat fragmentation. Whenever a species disappears because of its weakened gene pool, a knot is untied and parts of the net disintegrate. So, what if we were to remove one species from the rainforest? Would the system fall apart? Probably not. The volume of species, their genetic diversity, and the complexity of the ecosystems form such rich biodiversity in this forest that one species gap in the weave won't cause it to unravel. The forest can stay resilient and recover from change. But that's not true in every case. In some environments, taking away just one important component can undermine the entire system. Take coral reefs, for instance. Many organisms in a reef are dependent on the coral. It provides key microhabitats shelter and breeding grounds for thousands of species of fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. Corals also form interdependent relationships with fungi and bacteria. The coral itself is a loom that allows the tangled net of biodiversity to be woven. That makes coral a keystone organism, one that many others depend on for their survival. So what happens when destructive fishing practices, pollution, and ocean acidification weaken coral or even kill it altogether. Exactly what you might think. The loss of this keystone species leaves its dependence at a loss too, threatening the entire fabric of the reef. Ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity together form the complex tangled weave of biodiversity that is vital for the survival of organisms on Earth. We humans are woven into this biodiversity too. When just a few strands are lost, our own well-being is threatened cut too many links, and we risk unraveling it all. What the future brings is unpredictable, but biodiversity can give us an insurance policy, Earth's own safety net, to safeguard our survival. So come back to me, please. All right, so that told you a little about biodiversity. And one of the things which we're going to see a video on in a few minutes, right? We talked about climate and weather. And a big idea that a lot of people have been talking about is global warming and the greenhouse effect, because that can affect the entire planet. But first, let's talk about the difference between these two things. Remember how earlier I talked about Mars having a thin atmosphere and being cold, and Venus having a lot of carbon dioxide and being very warm? Well, Earth. If it were to have no life and no atmosphere, it would actually be about 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The idea here, however, is that the coldness is mitigated by our atmosphere. The atmosphere diffuses light, spreads out the temperature, and the water in the oceans help keep us at that homeostasis. 
But because of the gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, methane, and even water, we have a higher than expected temperature, which is due to the greenhouse effect or the idea that the blankets of the atmosphere make the earth warmer than you would expect just from its position in the world. That's different than the idea of global warming, which is that on average, the temperature of the earth is going up over time based upon previous measures. And so we were gonna talk about that in one of our demos, but part of what we wanna think about is these slogans that people talk about. So Joel in the opening talked about reduce, reuse, recycle, which is about the things we consume and how to reduce the amount of pressure we put on the earth. There's another one that I like to think about, which is small is beautiful. And the idea that you try to make small impacts on the earth or on your community and that you don't leave a footprint. And a lot of times with carbon, we talk about our carbon footprint or our environmental footprint, or our social footprint. And that's really talking about the idea of that as you walk through a forest or as you walk through your town, the, the marks you leave are your footprints. But the one I wanna share with you is perhaps the one I found most meaningful, most useful, and most applicable in every area. And that is, think globally, act locally. And the idea behind this slogan, and it can be used for the environment or economics, or just in your daily life is to always be considering the big picture as you take actions in your small space. This could be how you do things in your room and they have an effect on your house. And by the same token, your house has effects on your room. It could be how you have an effect in your one classroom at school that could have an effect on your entire school or your place in your town having an effect on our state, so on and so on. The idea is that many times a large problem like global warming seems impossible to tackle or loss of biodiversity or problems with water or air pollution. But if you can find a way that your simple local actions connect to that larger issue and then you can get other people to act on it with you, then perhaps you can affect a global problem with your local action, right? So remember, it, the idea is that in STEM is in everything you do, and it's through STEM that you can be successful at solving any of your problems. So now I'd like to pass it over back to Joel so he can introduce us to some of our hands-on STEM work related to climate and weather and the greenhouse effect. Thank you, thank you, Dr. LaPuma. Thank you for those encouraging words and that perspective that the video provided for us. Um, so now time for the bread and butter of this stream is our videos. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Erica so she can present her video. Hi everyone, I'm Erica. I am a chemical engineering major at NJIT. And for my video for Earth Day, we are going to learn how wind is measured. For success. Hello and happy Earth Day. My name is Erica and I am a mentor for STEM for Success. For today's experiment, we will be learning about how wind is measured. For this experiment, you will need six materials, which include two plastic straws, four small cups, one new pencil that is sharpened, one thumbtack, tape, and an optional material is a fan or hair dryer. Before we begin, please note that you can pause this video at any time to complete a step. But now let's get started. To start off this experiment, we are going to gather all of our materials and place them on a flat surface just like this. For this next part, we are going to be using our cups, straws, and tape. And what we're going to do is tape the middle, so this area of right here, of the cup to one end of one of the straws, like that. 
we'll use our tape. And tape it on just like that. And we're going to do that for every cup. Now, this is very important. So since this cup is going this way, we're going to want this next cup to go the other way, like that. We're going to do the same thing for the other straw. That's it. Now you are going to want to ask for help from either your parent or guardian or whoever is helping you with this experiment. And what you are going to do is place your straws so they are perpendicular to each other and make either a cross T, X, whatever you want to call it, just like that. Now what you want to do with this is in the center where they cross, you're going to put your pencil underneath and you're going to put the eraser there and stick the thumbtack through the straws and through the eraser. I'm going to do this on the floor so you guys can see better. in the end it should look just like this in order to measure the wind you're going to want to go outside I came to the beach where it's windy but if it's not windy don't worry you can use a hair dryer a fan or anything else that will generate wind So what you're going to do is push your pencil down, you're going to hold it lightly and let the wind turn. How does this experiment relate to STEM? Well, it is a perfect example of math and physics. Now you might be wondering, 
How can you measure something that you cannot see? To answer that, scientists and meteorologists use what is called an anemometer to measure wind speed. This is what was made in the experiment. An anemometer has four cups attached to horizontal rods, which are placed on a vertical pole. When the wind blows, the air pushes the cups and causes the anemometer to accelerate and spin. By counting the amount of times the anemometer spins in a given time, calculations can then be done to find out the speed of the wind. I hope you enjoyed this experiment. Thank you for watching and remember that STEM is in everything you do. That was a nice video. Got to take a little beach day right there, I saw. So now we will be moving on to our Q&A portion of that video. Uh, someone talking? I, I don't know what happened. It seems like we dumped out. You dumped out? Okay, so for the first question on the Q&A, it says, does the material matter for the sticks and cups? Um, so for the sticks, you definitely want them to be straws, but actually you can do cardboard pieces as well, but I found with straws personally that it's a lot easier to um, stick the thumbtack through. Um, as far as the cups, I definitely recommend doing those small Dixie cups because they work best. All righty. Well, our next question on that video is coming from Katie. What happens if you turn the cups a little off center? Um, so I'm assuming by off center, Katie means like angled down a little bit or not exactly towards the end of the straw. It honestly should not matter that much because with my cups, they were not perfectly straight and I didn't have them in a specific spot. I just kind of estimated it. So it should be fine. And then another question, why does the pencil need to be sharpened? So with the pencil being sharpened, that allows it to spin better because if the bottom of it is flat, it's not going to spin that much. All righty. Um, oh, this question is regard to uh, Dr. Lapuma's video. What is biodiversity? I wonder if he's here to answer. Yes, of course I'm here. All righty. Sorry, I, I put my video on. I turn it off so that people don't focus on me. So biodiversity, very simply, is the genetic system and population differences throughout the different types of levels. So at every level, so the Earth has lots of different ecosystems that comprise it. Each one of those ecosystems is made up of lots of different species, and each one of those species is made up of lots of different members that are all genetically different. And so those three kinds of biodiversity help us get together. Now, what's really interesting is, uh, for example, when I was in Stanford, as I mentioned before, they told us about a group of ants that were totally unique. And they only lived in one tree in the Amazon. And that one tree was an entire ecosystem onto itself where the ants and other creatures that live there were all unique to that one thing. So if you cut down that tree, you would wipe out an entire set of biodiversity for that. Similar to in the video when they showed you the ketone species of the uh, coral reef, where if you just wipe out that one coral reef, all the other species that depend on it will be knocked down. So biodiversity is really that interconnected web of living things and their environment that helps stabilize our uh, wonderful planet. Okay, thank you for the explanation. 
Uh, for anyone just joining us, um, you can access the Q&A form through the link in the description, which would lead you to the info page. And then in the info page is another link to the Q&A sheet. So without further ado, we'll move on to our next video by Emma. Hi guys, my name is Emma Hamza and I made a video with my coworker and friend Natalie who was unable to join us today, but we focused our video on greenhouse gases, which are a very important topic when it comes to um, talking about the health of the earth. So we can get started with that video. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Wilson, a sophomore chemical engineer student and a STEM for Success mentor. Hi, I'm Emma Hamza. I'm also a chemical engineering student and another STEM for Success mentor. Today we're going to be doing an experiment to demonstrate how greenhouse gases work in our environment. One of the things we like to discuss and focus on on Earth Day is the impact we're having on Earth. One of the most drastic ways we are changing Earth is through pollutants and greenhouse gases. Having too many greenhouse gases on Earth can have a lot of negative side effects such as increasing the temperature globally and changing the normal weather patterns. Although this is happening in real time on Earth, it's a lot easier for us to mimic it with an at-home experiment that we're gonna show you how to do. For this experiment, you'll need some sort of plastic container, some water, a clear carbonated beverage, a thermometer, and if your container doesn't have a lid, some plastic wrap and rubber bands. For the best results, you want to perform this experiment on a nice sunny day. Important. Take the water and pour it into the first container until it's about halfway full. Then take your clear carbonated beverage and fill the other container until it's halfway full. Then take your lid or plastic wrap and rubber band and securely cover both containers. Next, take your containers and move them into an area of direct sunlight. Now we're going to start taking measurements of the air inside of the container. Uncover the container and then put the thermometer in so it is only in the upper half of the container where the air is. Let the temperature settle and then record it. Do this with both containers. Write down the temperature that you measured and continue this experiment for the next hour, measuring every 10 minutes. After an hour, you should have a data table like this. You should be able to see a difference in the temperatures between the water and the carbonated beverage. To see it better, let's put it onto a graph. Here you can see that not only is the temperature in the carbonated beverage container getting hotter, it is doing so at a faster rate. This is due to the greenhouse gases that we had modeled in that container. So why do we choose a carbonated drink? To begin, let's talk about them. What makes carbonated drinks so bubbly? It's caused by carbonated. It's caused by carbonate. It's caused by carbonate. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie. We apologize, folks, for having some technical difficulties. But in the meantime, as we sort that out, let's answer some questions pertaining to the video that has already came in. Um, the first one being, what are some other gases in a greenhouse? Um, so some other greenhouse gases that we commonly find in our atmosphere is methane, um, which usually comes from uh, producing fossil fuels and livestock production. 
uh, nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides, which come from uh, usually uh, chemical productions. Alrighty, so our next question is, why do we need to use clear soda in the experiment? Yeah, so this is actually something we found when um, testing this experiment. Um, if you put two, uh, this has to do with how uh, color absorbs or ref uh, reflects light. So if you use a dark soda or a dark carbonated beverage, the liquid is going to absorb a lot of the light and heat, so it's going to mess up your um, data because your control or the thing you're comparing it to where there's no carbon dioxide water is also clear so the only variable you want to change in this experiment is that you're adding co2 through the carbonation so that's why you want to stick to a clear carbonated beverage so you're not adding multiple things to um, the beverage all right that's very insightful right there um, our next question is, what are pollutants? The pollutants are things that don't typically belong in the area that they are from or um, cause harm to that um, area. So we can find pollutants in our waterways, on our streets, or in our air. And so those are things like plastic can be a pollutant because it's something that doesn't belong in, say, a river and can harm the ecosystem there. So pretty much anything harmful for us or to any animals in the ecosystem, correct? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be harmful. Those would be harmful pollutants. Pollutants are anything that you would consider not normally found in the natural environment and so many times pollutants are just higher than normal levels of something um, hmm. in in some cases they're actually beneficial right it, it, not everything is harmful extra uh you know uh nitrous oxide in the air makes plants grow better as much so lots lots of extra nitrogen being fixed so is helpful is actually you know or, or extra fertilizers on the ground for, you know, if it goes too high, it's a pollutant, but at the right level, it helps our plants grow. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. When, when most people think about pollutants, they think uh, harmful chemicals, but good to see that some of the byproducts of making these uh, materials we use every day actually can help the earth sometimes. All There's right. a famous environmental comment which says, a weed is only a weed because it's a plant growing where you don't want it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start screen sharing again because I have the video pulled up on my computer and it should work this time. Okay. All Do right. you want to cut to the part or start from the beginning? I'm just going to cut to the part. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. And just let me know if you can hear it. Modeled in that container. Can you guys hear it? Yes. So why do we choose a carbonated drink? To begin, let's talk about them. What makes carbonated drinks so bubbly? It's caused by carbonation. Carbonation is a process where carbon dioxide is put at a very low temperature and a high pressure. This makes it dissolve into the water, which adds those tiny gas bubbles right to your drink. When a can or bottle of soda is opened, the pressure decreases and the temperature starts to increase. Because of this, the drink can no longer hold as much carbon dioxide bubbles as it could before. This causes it to be released into the air. Because of this, we can use the carbonated drink to model pollutants being released into the atmosphere, since they're both going to be releasing carbon dioxide. The next thing we're going to learn about is a greenhouse gas. A greenhouse gas is a type of gas that holds a lot more heat than normal air. Carbon dioxide actually is one of these. This is the reason why the air in the soda cup turns out to be a lot warmer than the air outside. In the normal environment, this is really harmful. Too much carbon dioxide on Earth will heat up the planet. When the planet gets too hot, the normal weather patterns can start to change and there can be a lot more storms than normal. On top of that, the ice caps in the North and South Pole can start to melt, which can affect sea life. Carbon dioxide can enter the Earth's atmosphere in a lot of ways, but the most common being cars, 
manufacturing products, and the use of electricity. You might be thinking now, how can you help fix this problem on Earth? The answer, start small. You can make small changes by walking instead of driving, making sure that you turn off your lights when you leave the room, and being sure that you reduce, reuse, and recycle all products before you decide to buy something brand new. Thank you guys so much for coming out today. We really hope that you could have learned something from this, and maybe you can even make some small changes to help the environment. Remember, STEM is in everything that you do. Alrighty, awesome video. Um, so another question that came up for the video is, does this mean soda is harmful for our air? So on a large scale, not particularly because the amount of CO2 used just to make soda and just release when you drink a can of soda is insignificant to the amount of CO2, CO2 produced and the other methods you explained in the video, say burning fuels, uh, manufacturing, and creating electricity. All right, so our next question after that is, is there gas that makes the air colder? Not that we currently know of. They do, they are trying to come up with ideas in the field of geoengineering, which would help um, cool down the earth by pausing the greenhouse effect but it costs a lot of money and is on such a large scale that it'd be really hard to pull off. And we don't know the long-term damages from something like that. So as far as we know, the best solution to stop the heating effect of greenhouse gases which is to stop creating them and to create methods to remove them. That actually brings up an interesting idea that we didn't really talk about, but is very environmental, which is a technological fix rather than a solution. And a, an example that many people used to use is the one my professor told me back in 1989. Uh, you have a headache, you take an aspirin. The next day you have a headache, you take an aspirin. That aspirin is a technology to fix the symptoms of the problem. But if you never figure out why every day you get a headache, then you're going to keep getting it. So not that technology isn't a great thing and not that those fixes aren't particularly useful, but sometimes we have to look at what they call the root cause or the main reason why there's a problem to see if the investing in changing the way we do things or evolving things may be better for us than just getting rid of the symptoms that we see immediately, because symptoms can sometimes be myriad and long ranging. And as we learned from the biodiversity video, these many systems can be connected. So if we continually ignore the symptoms of a problem, it may be getting worse without us realizing it. Yeah, that is very important insight that we should be looking at. That uh, at some point we can't just get a quick fix to a problem. Sometimes we actually have to get to the root of it and deal with it from there. All right, so it looks like our last question, does the water get hotter too? So yeah, this is um, another like issue that's tied into the whole greenhouse gas thing is the water does heat, but something that's really cool about water is it can take in a lot of lot of heat and energy before its temperature change, uh, temperature changes. So that's why it is important too that we don't overheat our atmosphere because as we overheat our atmosphere, that's also going to affect how much heat goes into our water. So not only is our atmosphere going to be heating. Our, earth, um, our water sources are going to be heating too, which is going to affect the water life. And that's why we see things um, like uh, melting icebergs, because it's coming from not only the air around the iceberg being uh, warmer, but also the water. All righty, thank you for that answer. Um, so far, I believe this is the end of the Q&A section. So um, I'd like to thank everyone that came today and watch the stream. Thank you, Dr. Lapuma, for your presentation. And thank you, our STEM mentors, for your videos and answers to our questions. We hope to see you guys um, on May 5th for our next STEM in Your Home live stream. So be there. And um, we hope you have all a great Earth Day. I think it's May 3rd. May 3rd? I didn't Is want it? to say May 5th. I didn't have the date pulled up, but... 
Yep. Oh, maybe it is the fifth. No, I think you're right. It's the first Monday of May. All righty. So make plans there. It will be at 1 o'clock on a Monday, correct? Yes. All right. I know. All right. So have a great day, everyone. All right. Bye.